Hi, and welcome to the Revolution. To be specific, the Revolution Pi, a set of industrial controllers from a company called Kunbus in Germany. And I have been sent a number of the modules, as you can see here, um, including two controllers, um, some digital I.O. modules, an analog I.O. module, and a gateway Ethernet IP module, which is this one at the end here. The two I have here are the Raspberry Pi 3 compute modules inside, and we'll open them up uh, partly through the video and have a look, just so I can show you. They're very nice inside. I've got one already partially disassembled here because I was having a little peek a little bit earlier. They're all DIN rail mountable. They'll run um, up to 24 volts DC. They have 24 volt digital inputs, outputs. Uh, the current analog I.O. module supports all of the standard industry values. So 4 to 20 milliamps, 0 to 20 milliamps, 0 to 10 volts, plus or minus 10, 1 to 5 volts, etc, etc, etc. It's quite a few. Uh, all of the circuit diagrams and everything else for these are all provided by the company online too. So they're not trying to hide anything. They still run the standard Raspberry Pi operating system but it has been tweaked with the real-time patches so that it gets rid of a certain level of uncertainty. Um, Kunbus have already um, provided a number of programming extensions into the Pi so that you can also use, for instance, Python or Node-RED or something like that to communicate with the extended modules. Now, the way that this works, and we'll go into a little bit more detail in, uh, in this video, but more extensively in other videos as I start to show you how to use these, is that they are based on a distributed uh, architecture. And the way it works with these, and I'll put some pictures up as we go through this as well, is you have the Raspberry Pi compute modules running in the core modules, but to communicate to all of the other modules, there is a, uh, a backplane bus that links between them. So like a little jumper that goes from each module in turn, based on a uh, little jumper like this that goes on the top of these modules. You can see the slots on this one here. If I turn the uh, compute module around, you can see slot here and here for expansion as well to connect to other modules so they just jump across like i said with these and what that is is it's a high speed communications bus that talks to microcontrollers that are in the io module they are using st micro microcontrollers in each of the modules so the core architecture at a high level of the revolution pi and its modules it's such that the Raspberry Pi compute module is managing the core functionality, the high level functions, um, log flow logic and things like that. But it leverages via a high speed interface, which I believe is based on an ethernet controller to communicate with all of the other modules. But these other modules use an ST micro microcontroller internally as the interface to the actual I.O. So it's able to offload the Raspberry Pi from those timing critical functions. Um, so if you're using uh, a rotary encoder or a counter or a PWM output and things like that, the main application can send the commands to the I.O. modules and then just let them get on with it. So we'll have a look at some of that functionality as we go through the review and the various videos to follow on from the initial um, overview that we're doing now. So I have enough parts that were sent to me kindly by RS Components from Germany to put together two operating systems. So I have the Revolution Pi Connect module, which is probably their most advanced Raspberry Pi based controller has additional Ethernet ports as well. I have the Revolution Pi Core 3 module, which is a uh, slightly reduced hardware version of the Kinect. Um, and then I have two digital I.O. modules, an analog I.O. module, and I have the Gateway Ethernet IP. So that's enough modules that I can put together um, a number of scenarios having these even talking to each other. They support Modbus out of the box. 
Uh, you can run Node-RED, you can run MQTT, and a whole bunch of other, pretty much anything you can run in a Raspberry Pi, you could run on these. They do have the gig of memory, they're using EMMC uh, flash for the program, not just an SD card, so they will run um, a, a lot faster as far as that is concerned. So I guess the next thing to do is to get these unwrapped and then I'll open up a couple of them so we can have a look at what the build quality is like, go through some of the specifications, and then in the next video we'll look at uh, setting them up and actually putting on some scenarios like Node-RED and do some controlling and things. Right out of the box they also have a uh, configuration GUI in there, so we'll have a quick look at that before we finish this video, just so you can see how much effort that Conbus has gone in uh, to making the configuration and use of these modules easy for the end user. So uh, I will grab some DIN rail and I will get these unpacked and put on the DIN rail and we'll have a closer look at them. Before I do that though, I just want to show you, this is how the modules come. They're actually completely cellophane wrapped and all the connectors are already on the module. So they've got the DIN rail mount, they've got uh, the clips on each side of it. Um, some information on the side, including things like, I believe, the default password. Yeah, there we go. So on the sticker, which is probably underneath the paperwork in the other one, it's got the um, login username, the login password, and the default, default password for the website and the shell. So of course you would normally change that as soon as you get these and you try to put them into a production environment. Uh, let me just take off the plastic wrap from this one and see if it's got the same bit of information on it. It should have, so let me just find a knife and we'll slice this one open. Let me just move these out of the way a second. we go, not that it matters terribly much about you seeing, oh, let me take a bit of plastic off, but nevertheless. Yeah, so right underneath we've got the sticker which tells us the default credentials that have been set up. Now, if I look at the um, other module, you can see that the I can see that the passwords are different for each of them. So they have given them unique passwords. It's not like it's the same password for every single module that they sell. It's not, or it doesn't appear to be anyway. So that is good. So it occurred to me during the wiring process that I wanted to show you inside some of these modules. So it'll be easier to do it before I get it all mounted on the DIN rail than after. So let's take one apart right now. We'll start off with the Raspberry Pi Connect. I'm picking this one initially because it actually has quite a complicated, uh, not complicated, but more than I expected, connecting. You've got 24 volts, 0 volts, functional grounds, 24 volt, 0 volt, a watchdog, and another functional ground. And then on this end, you've got a ground, an input, and two outputs. Now these are some built-in digital I.O. on the actual Connect, mod uh, Connect module itself, which is kind of cool, as well as the two Ethernet adapters and the RS-485. Um, so we've got this rather big connector here. So uh, what it ended up being is all I need to do is connect 24 volts and 0 volts to here. The rest is already um, pre-wired on the connector as you can see here, right? They've already pre-wired this. So we've got to shove in the extra wires in here, uh, clamp it, sorry, uh, above it here, and clamp it down. All of the connections on this one, and I think is all these push style connectors. A lot of the other modules use the screw connectors like that. So uh, anyway, this one is using the push style. So we just need to put 24 volts into here. Everything else is all pre-wired on the bottom which is kind of cool. Saves a bit of wiring. So I wanted to show you though what is inside here. So all of these connections just pull out. Um, taking these apart you have to be careful and you have to do it in the right order. So the top comes off first um, and then the side modules. Now if you look carefully on these you will see that there are just little tabs here um, that you have to just gently manipulate to get it apart. Now you don't need to take yours apart because I'm going to take this one apart. Saves you having to do it. 
And just so we can have a look what's inside, I'll take a couple of pictures and things, and then we'll put it back together and we'll start having a look at it, power it up, etc. Anyway, so let me just take this apart. I'm not going to make you go through the torturous process of watching me take it apart. And once that laid out, I will show you. Okay, first up we have the Revolution Pi RevPi Connect controller module. I've opened it up and in this case I am able to remove the compute module from here because it is not secured with adhesive, it's just screwed in place, which is a good uh, thing because it means you could change it if you wanted to. So, what do we have on this board? Well, on the main board, which is the controller, um, you'll find when we get to the RevPi uh, Core 3 that it's almost this, functionally this left side board is the same as the RevPi Core 3 in that we've got the um, Pi 3 compute module we have the Ethernet controller with Ethernet and a 4 port USB hub on it two ports going to the front and uh, one port USB going across on the ribbon cable to other things. Um, we have an RS-485 driver going up to the Pi bridge and we have an Ethernet controller going up to the Pi bridge as well. Um, down here we have a real-time clock. You'll find that even though we can't see it, there'll be one of those on the uh, Pi 3 core module as well. And we have a a battery backup. I don't know if it's a battery or a um, super cap, but it's it says only 24 hours of backup, so it may only be a super cap um, for the real-time clock. And then we have the power management for the 12 to 24 volts coming in. A uh, little switching regulator circuit and everything else going to give us 3.3 volts and 5 volts to power everything. Um, the expansion board here, the B side. Um, for want of a better word, has its own 24 volt input. It also has uh, RS-485 output, a second Ethernet controller, and a digital I.O. module all built into this. Um, here we have its own magnetics. Uh, we also have a, another Ethernet controller. This one has two USB ports, although they're not actually used for anything outside. We have the RS-485 controller going up to here, and I'm assuming one of these is also connecting to the Pi bridge as well, uh, the second Pi bridge. There's two Pi bridges on each module. And what else do we have on here? We have a relay that can give us um, up to 30 volt switching capacity output. They're just a pair of open contacts, so you can have them connecting to all sorts of things as long as you don't exceed the 30 volts, and I think about two amps. There is a uh, digital input which allows you to have a uh, 0 to 24 volt or 0 or 24 volt signal coming in. Could be from a UPS, for example, or some other control system um, to let you indicate to the processor that something's going on. And what else is on here? I think that's pretty much it. So the basic conclusion of what I can see here is that this Pi bridge has a combination of Ethernet signaling as well as RS-485 signaling in and out and something they call SNF which is probably um, I2C or something like that I'd imagine. Uh, you can see it on the schematics. I think there's security chips on all of the boards that it may be able to interrogate. I'm not sure. Um, the distributed system uh, with all of these controllers with the I.O. modules seems to all be via communicating with RS-485 to the ST micro controllers that are on each board and every single one of them except for the main uh, compute modules has one of the ST micro controllers in it for basic management and everything else. Um, the network one, which we'll get to a little bit later, I think you'll find, you'll see um, seems to have the ability to directly communicate via the Ethernet connections because it has an Ethernet switch built into it and um, it's got three Ethernet connections on it in total, two via RG45 connectors and one via the Pi bridge. So my assumption would be, and this is just speculation, that you can probably have the Pi compute modules communicating via the Ethernet as a bridge but talking to the SD microcontroller on it to manage the switch locally. Uh, maybe it's able to do some of the protocols for you and things like that as well. I'm not sure yet till we get to play with it. 
Um, but I think that's pretty much everything that's on these modules. Like I said, these, the main, um, sorry, on this module. So that's pretty much everything on this module. Like I said, this is the main Pi compute module, Pi 3. Um, giga RAM, 1.2 gig 4 core processor, 4 gigs of EEMC flash, uh, real-time clock. The Pi firmware, Raspbian, has uh, the real-time patches put on it so that it fixes some of the issues that people have had in the past with industrial controllers based on a Raspberry Pi or based on any Linux-based system not being um, consistent enough with timings. And this module, because of the extra Ethernet and things like that, can also communicate, um, you know, one for the, say, an internal automation network, and then the other port potentially being used for communicating with um, the internet or higher level uh, business servers and things like that, maybe as a bridge. So this particular module would work as a very, very good ethernet bridge slash gateway for IoT applications as well, because it does have um, the ability to completely isolate local ethernet and remote ethernet by using the two modules, uh, the two ethernet adapters. Now, the other, you know, by using the Ethernet I.O. module, which is a separate module we'll look at in a little bit, um, you could also extend it to have even more, you know, support for Modbus and other protocols, and that's the one that has the switch built in. Anyway, that's pretty much everything about this module. Um, as I said, lots of protection on the I.O., lots of protection on the power supplies, very good built, no bodges that I can find. Um, they come apart fairly easily. You got to be the plastic's a little bit delicate when it's opened up like this. When it's together, they form a fairly robust shell. That's pretty much it. So let me get this put back together, and we'll look at the next module. Here we have the Revolution Pi Core module. It's the Core Three. Uh, I can't take out the CPU module because it's actually um, looks like it's epoxied in on the connectors. The um, Connect module may be slightly different, but to, to externally it looks like this side of it's the same. So we have the Raspberry Pi 3 compute module right here, which, which has the 1 gig of RAM, a 1.2 gigahertz 4 core uh, processor. It has a 4 gig of EMMC core uh, flash. Un just underneath here is a uh, what looks like either a super cap or a uh, button cell for probably keeping the real-time clock and things uh, active. We have the 24 volt, well, 12 to 24 volt DC-DC uh, DC converter, so that it supplies the 5 volts and the 3.3 volts needed for all the circuitry. We have a physical Ethernet controller here, which is typically the same as we have on... Um, sort of regular Raspberry Pi 3B pluses and things like that, which has the USB um, connections or USB hub built in as well as an Ethernet built in. Um, over here, interestingly, we have two um, Ethernet controllers connecting to the Pi bridge connectors. So there's two of them. There's two Pi bridge connectors on the back of here. Well, it's actually, yeah, it's on the back. And we have two Ethernet controllers that are connected to make it all work. And these are using the um, microchip KESZ8851s. They're 10 slash 100 base T Ethernet controller with generic uh, 816 or 32 bit or SPI interfaces. Um, I've been trying to find a schematic for this, haven't found it yet. I'm going to have another quick look right now. And if I find it, I'll show you the block diagram of the. Um, Revolution Pi 3 Core, sorry, get the name right, Rev Pi Core 3. So really there's not a lot else to show in here. Um, functionally it's very much like a Raspberry Pi. Um, this one does not have the watchdog. Yeah, nothing in the specifications that mentions any watchdog or anything like that. So this is pretty much everything you've got. You've got the HDMI output on a micro HDMI connector. You've got a USB port for um, programming and things like that. Um, when you are connected via the USB port, uh, one of the things I found out, which you need to be aware of, is that the compute module will not boot the operating system and run while you have a USB connected to your computer through here. 
Um, I guess you're either in programming mode or update mode or you're in run mode. You can't be in both. So you would normally connect through um, the Ethernet port to talk to this module, not through this USB. The two standard USB ports here, I haven't tried connecting to those or anything like that, but I wanted to just point out that this smaller one here is for programming, not for general use. Um, and that pretty much covers it for the RevPi Core 3. Here we have the internals of the digital I.O. module. Uh, some key things to point out with it is, first of all, the use of IEC 6131-2 compliant input and output drivers. We have two um, octal input chips here, which are receiving the 0 to 24 volt inputs and providing a uh, 5 volt compliant output. Uh, they connected in this case with SPI connectivity through to these isolator modules. These are two six channel digital isolators that then connect to this STM32F205 microcontroller. The microcontroller in turn connects through RS485 to the Pi bridge, which then connects across to the master controllers. Um, we have a separate input for the 24 volt digital I.O., which is up here, which is connected here. We have an input 24 volt supply and an output 24 volt supply. So technically you could have them um, separate because on the board, they are completely digitally isolated from each other. We've got the power supply over here for the digital output and the isolated inputs for the digital inputs over here. Um, this power set of circuitry here is purely to drive the STM32F205 microcontroller at the bottom. So um, there's really not a lot to say about that. I will link in the various data sheets for the chips. Um, they are connected directly to the I.O. outputs. We have basically 14 I.O. lines. Um, seven in and seven out, and they have all the usual um, industrial characteristics. For instance, the outputs are high side drive. They have uh, fault conditions, for instance, short circuit, open circuit, overcurrent, etc. And the inputs are uh, not to 24 volts, and they're also optically isolated as well. Um, so not a lot else to say about this module. There are certainly no um, bodge mods or anything that I can see on the board. The back is completely clean, very nicely made. So um, yeah, and it's also minus 40 to plus 50 degrees centigrade operating temperature range along with the main controllers. So let's go look at the next module. Here we have the analog I.O. card opened up. I've taken it off of the uh, back panel this time because we actually have a double loaded board this time. The back is not clear. So what we have here is the standard Pi bridge connection that all the modules have. We've got an input and an output daisy chaining along to the next one. Um, in this case, we're using the RS485 uh, connection as well. The chip for that is actually on the bottom of this. We'll show that in a minute. What we have on the top here is we have um, the standard analog input output up here and we have 24 volts being supplied to the module. But what we also have here is we have a uh, switching power supply here, which is bringing it down to usable voltages for the STM32F205 chip that's on the back of here. But we also have two um, complete power supply modules that are identical here and here which are driving the analog inputs and the analog output sides of the system. And if you look at these, they're basically pretty much identical. They're probably providing isolated five volts, maybe plus and minus 15 volts and things like that. The schematics will show us more details and maybe in another video we'll have a closer look at this. So here's all the um, op amps and things for signal conditioning, probably for the analog inputs. Uh, we've got a DAC here for the analog output. Now these DACs support 4 to 20 milliamps, 0 to 5, plus or minus 10, etc., etc. They're perfect for industrial control use. Uh, we have a digital isolator here so that the controller can talk to the DAC and be completely isolated from it. 
uh, we have a digital isolator here which allows the controller to talk to this ADC. Now we've got um, four analog inputs and two analog outputs and we also have a couple of RTD inputs. So really that means we've got a total of six uh, analog inputs. Um, what they've done on here though is we've got a DAC on the top here and we also have a DAC on the other side of the board. If I flip this over a second, we have another DAC here with its own isolator. And we have another ADC here with its own isolator. So we have two completely independent ADC modules and two completely independent DAC modules running. And again, here's the two isolators here as well. Here is our RS-485 interface, which goes into the STM32 microcontroller that's on the bottom here and you can clearly see that CAN bus has gone to a lot of effort to isolate all of the different areas of this to reduce noise, to reduce a risk of frying your controller and any inter-system noise that might happen. So potentially with this whole um, system of the CAN bus I.O. modules and controllers you could have your analog uh, system or even your digital system on a completely separate 24 volt supply completely isolated from other 24 volt systems if you wanted to you have the choice um, well I guess when you connect it all up and that's one of the reasons why there are more power connections on these modules than what you would normally find for instance on the digital IO we had a 24 volt supply for the digital inputs, a separate 24 volt supply for the digital outputs, and a third 24 volt supply for the STM32 microcontroller side of everything. They're not bringing the power over these Pi bridge connectors. You're actually supplying it into the module completely separately. So this is the DAC, well digital, sorry, this is the analog IO module. Um, there's a lot more on this, so I'd imagine that this one is probably a little more expensive than the other modules. But again, no bodges that I can detect, very well made, lots of vias, um, lots of ground planes to reduce noise and things like that. So quite impressed with the build, quite impressed with the quality. Again, all of the parts are um, very well selected. They're either uh, microchip their Maxim or their Texas Instruments so far that I've looked at. I mean, not including the magnetics, like they've got the Worth inductors and the Halo um, transformers. They're using these transformers, by the way. Uh, they're setting up an, a control circuitry on one side and using the transformer to literally magnetically isolate or use it as a transformer, really, the supplies on the other side. Um, these are because you're trying to get a lot more power isolated as opposed to a digital isolator which is very low current and it's just a digital isolation not a power isolation these are providing power isolations so yeah that's the analog IO module um, you've got a few LEDs up here probably for status and things like that you've got the actual analog IO connections on the top and that's pretty much everything on here again daisy chainable using the, um, get that in focus, Pi Bridge connectors. All right, so that's all of the main modules that I have. Um, I think I have one more module somewhere that is a network interface. So let me just go grab that and that will be the last one we have a look at. From an IO perspective, from a digital IO, analog IO, that's all the modules I've got. So let me just go grab that one and that'll be all of them. Okay, so here is our final module. It is a little bit different in that it has a different ST micro uh, controller on here. Uh, this one is actually, let me just have a double check again, and STM32F427. So a little bit more of an advanced microcontroller and it has an external 32 megabit uh, flash connected to it um, right here. The other thing that's different about this module, this is, and I didn't say what it was, this module is called the Gateway Ethernet IP. And it actually technically has three Ethernet connections on it. 
One is up here coming in from the um, Pi bridge connector and the other two are connecting to two Ethernet ports, one on the top and one on the front. Um, these two, and I'm assuming the one up here, all connect through this three-port managed Ethernet switch, which is a KSZ8863 um, chip sitting right in the middle here. So rather an interesting design in that there is still the RS-485 communications to the SD microchip available um, via the Pi bridge, but we also have the Ethernet system being all connected up too. If you remember when we looked at the um, RevPi Core 3, um, it was having two Ethernet controllers, sorry, two Ethernet chips interfacing to the Pi bridge, as well as a separate Ethernet chip with USB connecting up to the front panel uh, Ethernet and USB connectors. The RevPi Connect had, from what I could see, um, one Ethernet connection going up onto the Pi bridge and two via a um, two separate Ethernet controllers going to the front panel. And one of the Ethernet controllers had a four port USB bridge, the other one had a two port USB, uh, sorry, hub. So this one looks like it's potentially communicating with the controller via the Ethernet. Um, I don't know without analyzing software, but it certainly looks that way. Um, but anyway, this is everything that's on the board here. You can't, there's nothing on the back to look at. A little bit of I.O. here to drive status LEDs, uh, switch configuration, power input, and that is pretty much it. So that's pretty much all of the boards. So uh, now let's get it all put back together and on the DIN rail. Okay, for you guys, a second has gone by. For me, it's been a day or two. Been busy wiring things up and connecting various I.O. devices to do the next video, video for scenarios, etc. But for now, I'm just going to show you what I've wired up, show you quickly the web interface, and then this video will finish. I will start the next video uh, showing you how to in perform your initial setup for the Revolution Pi Connect and RevPi Core 3, and then we'll go on and do a few experiments, loading Node-RED and things like that, running some applications within Node-RED, getting it to read temperatures, humidity, a whole bunch of things. Anyway, without further ado, let's go have a look at what I've created on my um, prototyping board, and uh, I'll give you a walkthrough. Okay, so here we have a close-up of the board. You can see here we've got a uh, mains coming in, goes into this panel with a couple of mains outlet sockets just in case I need them, a couple of USB outputs for powering devices. That comes down, we've got mains distribution on the terminal strips here, one of them feeding into the 24 volt 10 amp power supply which I use for I.O. 24 volt distribution bus bars here and here for plus 24 and 0 volts. I've used white and black for the mains because in North America those are the colors you use for mains, white and black. The white being the neutral and the black in this case being the live. Um, on this side I've got red for plus 24 and blue for ground in most cases uh, and yellow for signal wires. These are the I.O. the blue terminal strips at the end. That uh, pretty much covers the first DIN rail. Uh, the next in row is where all the magic's really happening. So um, from left to right, a couple of NFC timer relays from Schneider. These are just sitting here to provide some mains capable outputs from the controllers because they will drive 24 volts, but they won't drive mains directly. So I put these relays in just in case I want to uh, drive them. And I've connected these to the DIO board that is part of the RevPi Core 3. So these two yellow wires popping out here on D1 and D2, 
they come down through the trunking and out to each of the relays. The relays are powered by this 24 volt supply up here, not by one of these two power supplies. And the common is on the uh, wiring for the DIO on the I.O. side. If you remember earlier when we were going through the design, I, I mentioned that the complete actual digital I.O. section on the board is completely isolated electrically from the ST micro that's on there and the rest of the uh, Pi bridge circuitry in the controller, etc. So we just have to have the 24 volt supply that's dealing with the I.O. Uh, common to the relays to be able to drive them and that's what I've done. Uh, the next thing here is this Siemens logo power supply. I needed a couple of small 24 volt power supplies for the controllers and I wanted to keep them on separate power supplies. I could have used the one big 10 amp power supply for absolutely everything, but I wanted to kind of simulate more of a distributed environment. So I used these little power supplies. Um, this one, the logo, Siemens logo power supply here, drives this four port ethernet hub, the DIO and the core three. And this is the ethernet, uh, gateway ethernet IP controller. I have not wired that in yet. It will be part of this bus once I'm done. Um, so we've got the DIO, which gives us 14 digital inputs and 14 digital outputs. Then we have the RevPi Core 3, which its specifications at the base level is exactly the same as the Revolution Pi Connect, just minimal amount of I.O. compared to the RevPi Connect. That completes this section. Next we have a Courgette 24 volt power supply. Uh, in the description and things, uh, when I post this all, I will provide links to RS Pro 24 volt DINRAIL power supplies. So the next item is this RevPi DIO again. Here you'll see I have two inputs connected and what these connect to are or is a digital encoder. So this is just a little switch type device which when you rotate it, it behaves as an encoder. So it gives a phased output depending on the direction that you can use to count up, count down, control speed and stuff like that. So I've connected that to the digital inputs on this module, not the outputs. The next module obscured by a few of these wires here is the analog I.O. module. At the bottom, we have the analog outputs, which are connected up. There's the common, and then we've got the two signal outputs. These actually throw, flow through the DIN rail, come out on this cable here, so what this leads to is a Laskar Panel Pilot LED digital panel meter, which has two analog inputs that can take a up to from zero up to 40 volts uh, input, and you can scale it. Um, you can have dual display, single display, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What I've configured it for here is to show. Uh, air temperature and humidity. I mean, as far as the meter is concerned, really, it's just seeing two zero to 10 volt signals, one that represents the air temperature and one that represents humidity. Now, this is connected to a sensor that I have uh, outside right now, and we're in Canada. We're actually been going through a minus 24 degrees centigrade today. Um, this was before I I'm recording this section where it was reading minus eight outside. And what I'm doing is I'm reading it in through, uh, it's actually an ESP8266 based board with a uh, temperature humidity sensor on it. And I'm collecting the data via node red, converting it to equivalent voltages and feeding it up to this dual channel uh, digital panel meter. And uh, I will have separate videos on how you can configure one of these panel meters and set them up for various scenarios. And I'll use this scenario in my example. Um, the next output on here, sorry, that's the two outputs. Uh, on this top half of it is an analog input. And what I'm using there, if you follow it up through, it ends up on this right hand side set of three DIN rails. And it flows up to this um, RS Pro touchless infrared thermometer. It will. It actually has an IR uh, screen on the other side of it, and even at a distance, it can measure the temperature of surfaces uh, quite accurately. Right now, it's just happily measuring the panel that's behind it, and it's 21.3 degrees centigrade. Uh, that is feeding into 
the um, analog input and is representing a uh, 0 to 10 volt signal which is representing a 0 to 100 degrees centigrade temperature reading so it makes it nice and easy to do conversions. This is feeding in being read by the analog input uh, and then being uh, processed and displayed on a node red user interface screen which we'll have a look at in the next video as well. I'll quickly show you the screen here but I'm not going to go through the details. Finally we have the Revolution Pi uh, Connect which has um, the Ethernet port connected to it which runs off to the hub and it's got 24 volts. Now this DIO, AIO and RevPi Connect are all being powered from this courgette. All of the I.O., so these power connections up here, are coming from this 10 amp 24 volt supply up the top. The analog module uh, does not have a external 24 volt supply coming into it. What it does is it uses the module 24 volt supply and actually has um, two complete separate DC to DC converters that provide an isolated DC signal and it takes the 3.3 volt rails for the microcontroller and things inside this module and it converts it into a 5 volt uh, and a plus and minus 15 volt to drive the analog inputs as well as the analog outputs. There's two separate supplies completely independent being driven. One for the analog outputs and one for the analog in. So you can have completely different isolated set of signals even on the analogs here without worrying about interference. You don't have to put them all to a common ground. The final bit that's at the bottom here is just the Ethernet running off to my um, internet hub and also a couple of mains outlet sockets which are driven by these relays. So in our scenarios when we start doing some examples I will have this Revolution Pi Connect doing some processing, maybe measuring temperatures, and then sending um, network signals to this uh, RevPi Rev Core 3, and it will decide then to maybe turn on a fan or uh, a light or something like that that can be mains powered. So we'll have a, an actual operating scenario that we can use for experimentation. That's pretty much all of the wiring. It took a little while to set this up. I think I did it twice because I kind of changed my mind halfway through. Uh, and that's it. So um, and in case you're wondering, um, I do have a ground fault circuit protector on the other end of this cable um, for my own protection. Uh, none of these connections can easily be touched, but obviously if I use a bare metal screwdriver and poke into these things, then you know I could get a shock. But I, as I said, I do have a GFI in the circuit um, it's just not in screen. Um, I've tried to make the wiring on here as neat as possible, but uh, this is not a complete production ready wiring, even though it is on a test panel. For instance, what I haven't wired in here is the uh, frame grounds to everything. So on this power supply, etc. The DIN rails themselves are connected to ground. So any of these units that have a DIN rail ground connection will be getting a ground of sorts but ideally in a production environment you would run the frame ground so there's each of these modules has one uh, and here as well as the power supply you would run that everywhere from a star point or something or put in a uh, ground set of DIN rails uh, terminals that you could then run all your grounds to. I just ran out of space on here so I decided that for the scenario it isn't necessary uh, obviously for production it would be. And that is all the wiring. Now what does this look like from a, <laughs> a different perspective uh, you know, without the complications of all the uh, mains and everything else? Well I drew up a little Visio diagram to show you so let me just grab that. Okay here we go. So this is what I have. Um, as you can see here I've just represented blocks for the power supply so we've got the 24 volt power supply that's 10 amp that feeds all of the actual I.O. side of the modules and it also provides the supply for the temperature sensor the digital panel meter and the two uh, NFC relays and running down into the module side it's powering the D.I.O. Um, on both sides but that's really all it's powering in the modules. I have two independent 24 volt uh, 15 watt power supplies and these are powering the controller side of all of the modules. 
Now, the one thing that I've added since I recorded the previous part of the video is a PT100 resistance temperature detector. And this is uh, just arrived actually this morning from RS Components. They've actually provided all of the components for this, including the NFC relays, the panel meters, the temperature sensor, uh, the power supplies. Over, the, I've done many videos for them. So I've just, a lot of these I already had. Put them, they're very, very handy for putting together in scenarios like this. So that's what I've done. All the part numbers from RS I've included on this diagram, and I will post this diagram so that you can have a closer look and you know things with the documentation on Design Spark. So you can see it's pretty straightforward. You've got the rotary encoder with two signals going into the DIO. You've got the temperature sensor with a single uh, signal going into the analog input 1 which is giving us a 0 to 10 volts representing the uh, 0 to 100 degrees centigrade. You can actually program this module to have different ranges but that's what I did for this. It makes the math easy when you want to convert it into something else. Uh, the two digital panel meter has got two analog outputs. Uh, I'm feeding 0 to 10 volts on each one representing minus 20 to plus 50 degrees centigrade and 0 to 100 percent relative humidity on here. Um, the On the other side with the RevPi Core 3, I've got two D outputs, DO1 and DO2, feeding the Schneider relays. And that pretty much is the complete scenario. So um, I think that's really where I want to call it for this video. And the next one will be powering all of this up and doing the initial setup of the RevPi Core 3 and or the RevPi Connect is pretty much the same for either one. And then we'll get Node-RED up and running and I will show you what I've co configured for running Node-RED. Now before I go, I will just show you the Node-RED screen that I have that's already operational. So here we go. Um, this is connected to the RevPi connect module so you can see here I've got a numeric um, display of the encoder settings I've just rebooted the RevPi connect 3 so it's currently seeing zero because I haven't adjusted anything let me go and twiddle the dial and we should see that count up once okay so I thought I gave it 40 clicks but I guess I only gave it 39 and you can see there it's incremented up all I did was rotate the encoder a little bit and uh, there we have it. So it's actually giving a count. And that is one of the inputs on the DIO. You can actually configure it literally as an encoder. Uh, through the beginning of the video, I explained to you that it has a distributed architecture on this system and that the Raspberry Pi cannot directly access the DIO or AIO functionality. It has to go through the Pi bridge and communicate with the subcontrollers, the ST microcontrollers that are on each of those modules, and it instructs those what the configuration is and what to do with it. And one of those things is to literally say, use these two inputs for an encoder. The ST micro will then manage the whole logic of monitoring the pins and counting up or down as somebody would rotate the dial. Uh, same goes for the analog module. When the analog inputs or outputs are, have been set, the SD micro on that board will continually sample the analog inputs, for instance, and set them up and transmit them to the microcontroller on request. But the microcontroller does not have to wait for the sample to be done when it needs it. It just asks for it and it gets it right away. In the background, there is a task that runs on the Raspberry Pi that is actually continually updating a set of tables that is contained in memory is presented to the programmer on the Raspberry Pi as a file that can be accessed just the same as any other uh, device in a Linux system. And there's plenty of help on the Cunbus website with tutorials and things like that. And part of what I'm doing in my Raspberry Pi code, as you'll see in the next video, is leveraging that interface to uh, get the values of the A to D inputs and the RTD, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, um, I think that's pretty much everything. So I've shown you this all working. The IR temperature here, you see, is being read and displayed on a trend. The RTD is on the trend line as well. The remote uh, temperature sensor, which is outside, and we're here in Canada, is warmed up to a balmy minus 15 degrees centigrade right now. And the humidity is sitting at about 65%. 
um, yes, it's pretty cold out there. Last night, I think, with the wind chill, we were down to minus 39 degrees centigrade. So uh, I'll bring up, I'll just show you the one that's for the RevPi Connect because they're pretty much the same except for the picture changes. And so here we are. This is the RevPi Connect. You connect to the component um, over the network. They host a web page for you. And what you can do is you can drag in the modules that you have connected, which is I've already done dragging in the AIO and the DIO module. And then in the bottom here, I've got things covering this up. You can configure what you want to do with the IO lines and everything. I'm going to go into that in another video, but this is the interface that is provided to you by default. And what this interface actually does is pretty much set the configuration file on the hard drive that will, on power up, send out the required configuration to each of the connected modules to tell them how they need to set themselves up. And that's pretty much what this does. So when you change this, you can't, just because you set this up doesn't mean that automatically you've got something reading those signals and being presented it to a display. You can't look at the signals in this display. You can preset them. For instance, if I go into the DIO module, which was what I was about to do. Um, these are the inputs. These are the names. You can override all these names. Here's the counters. And this counter one is the one that's actually going to be used for the encoder. Here's the outputs, and I've actually preset them both to go to one. So on power up, uh, as it initializes, it will actually turn on these two outputs. The rest will remain zero, which is pretty cool. Anyway, um, now finally, that is everything. So if you liked the video, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, well, then don't. Um, if you want to ask any questions, feel free to uh, email me or post comments under the video, and I'll do my best to answer them for you. In the meantime, I look forward to you seeing my next video. Uh, till then, bye for now.